Uh, well, as you can see, the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, joins us in the studio. Great to see you this morning. And, of course, we will be dwelling on England in just a moment. Sure. And, of course, uh, the latest revelations on COVID. But, but you're making a fairly significant announcement, I have to say, today, uh, in terms of life sciences. Tell us about it. Absolutely right. Um, life sciences have been really at the forefront of our fight uh, against COVID. And people know around the world that the UK is really a leader, a world uh, leader in uh, the life sciences. And today we're launching uh, the life sciences vision, which is essentially a strategic look at how we can maximise uh, great potential and our ability in this really crucial area. It's all about uh, being able to uh, get proper medicine, have high level research and critically commercialising that research, making great businesses out of uh, really strong uh, fundamental science. Well, like any, any progress that can be made, particularly on cancer, dementia, anything like that, learning the successes from COVID-19, I think people will appreciate. Absolutely. But at the same time, we are now in a situation where we were listening to the health secretary yesterday. We, we could be seeing cases, new daily cases, uh, in excess of 100,000 over the summer. I, I just want to dig down just a little bit deeper into, mm. into what that might actually mean. If we're talking about cases of 100,000 a day, perhaps by the time we reach August. By, by the 16th of August, when, when the rules change on self-isolation, you could have over a million and a half people self-isolating because they have had, they had a positive test. You could have probably double that, people that they've come into contact with, even people who've been double vaccinated, who would also be off work. Can we just have someone from the government concede there will be millions of people who will be isolating this summer as a result of the unlocking? I don't think you can necessarily conclude that there'll be millions. We've always said uh, so significant. We've like always said that significant number. The numbers would be going up, but of course, the critical thing, Neil, is what the hospitalisation rates and uh, the uh, fatalities as well. And the numbers we've seen on that have been much, much lower than anyone anticipated. And that's because of the success of the vaccination program. And I think that's what's giving people protection. We've always said, uh, we've always believed that um, infection rates might go up, but the critical point is what the the effect of those. Uh, infection rates is and I think the vaccination double doses particularly give a, a measure of protection that we're that we're happy with. It, it will clearly though however have an effect on business which we'll talk about in just a second mm. but in addition long Covid is, it is clearly a thing and if we're talking about a hundred thousand new cases a day I mean estimates vary but a ballpark figure of five thousand people a day acquiring long Covid or, or, or in, at some point in the future achieving long, uh, acquiring long Covid symptoms. I mean, that's, that's not beyond the imagination, is it? It's not beyond the imagination, but I think we've got to get... Uh, I think you're getting ahead of, of, of where we are mm -hmm. because uh, what I speak to, what I, what, I, what I hear, is that we can't simply uh, lock down the society forever. We have to reopen. If we don't reopen fully on the 19th of July, the implications of that would be simply just to delay all of this uh, till perhaps September and, and, and in the winter where it, things would become more difficult. So it's a balancing act. We have to decide uh, what to do. And, and I think this is the best uh, course of action. I mean, viewers will see that I have my, my, I've had a vaccine badge on this morning. My second mm. jag was yesterday, which is, it explains in part why I'm a little bit grumpier this morning uh, than, than, than usual. But why, if we're going to open up the country in July, why are people like me going to have to wait until August to avoid self-isolating if I come into contact like this? at this sure. distance from someone who's COVID-19 positive. Yeah, I mean, again, there's, there's always a balance. So people on the one hand are saying that uh, the 19th of July is too soon for general reopening, and other people are saying uh, that it's not soon enough. In the case of self-isolation, we feel that it does, uh, delaying it for four weeks does give a measure of protection. It allows more and more people to be jabbed. And we think that that's, uh, th that's a precaution that, that's worth, uh, worth taking. But we're opening up hospitality. People mm. will be in pubs, bars, restaurants, potentially without wearing their masks. We understand, of course, that the hospitality sector, 16 to 34-year-olds make up 60% of the workforce, and none of them, well, very few of them, will be double vaccinated, even by the middle of August. Do you accept the fact that the hospitality industry is going to be hit incredibly hard if hundreds of thousands, even millions of people are going to be self-isolated as a result of us opening up, perhaps, in the view of some, just a little bit too early? I think we're making all sorts of assumptions here. Well, we've got um, to. Uh, we've, we've got, got to make to. some... You're modelling, you're yeah, modelling course, we're modelling. Yeah, we've got to make... But, we're, but you're always looking at uh, the, the worst possible case. 
My own view about the hospitality sector is that they were very, very keen to reopen. If you speak to pub owners, if you speak to people uh, in the hospitality business, they were very disappointed that we didn't open up on the 21st of June. And I think many of them, uh, the majority, would say that this is the actual, the right precaution to be, to be taking. They're well, very think, happy. I think, I think they were all very happy because they assumed that come July the 19th, people who were double vaccinated would be able to avoid self-isolating. I mean, obviously, you're the business sector, you know a fair amount about business, but, you know, Julian Metcalf, you know, the founder mm -hmm. of Itsu, the founder of pret a -Manger, I mean, he's described this strategy, and I quote, as completely and utterly mental. Well, it, you, you can't have it both ways. On the one hand, we're saying that we want to reopen, but we're giving a measure of precaution in terms of delaying um, the, the self, lifting the self-isolation restrictions. It's a balance. It's not, it's not a perfect uh, solution, but on the one hand, we're saying that we can reopen, and on the other hand, we're saying that we want to give a little bit more protection in terms of the self-isolation rules. Sure, but it, it's not even just people in business that are saying this, and the head of the Hospitality UK has made similar comments to Mr Metcalf. I mean, Ian Duncan Smith makes the point, look, why go into a pub where people are not still adhering to the rule of six, you know, where there's no social distancing? Because in all likelihood, if you go to the pub more than a couple of times a week, you will get pinged at some point so, and you will have to isolate. So the big thing here is that we need to rely on people's judgment. Uh, there's a, a common sense uh, and a degree of uh, individual responsibility. That's always going to be, ultimately, what we have to rely on. And in this instance, we've said we're going to reopen, uh, people will be allowed uh, not to wear masks, to do uh, what they, they choose. But also, the businesses themselves will be conducting uh, business in a responsible way. I think this is perfectly reasonable. Just in terms, though, of, of who might well be affected, I mean, we, we understand, of course, the younger you are, the less likely it is that mm. you've had a vaccine, certainly to be double vaccinated. Isn't it the case? I mean, you, you, you don't accept the figure of, of, of several million people uh, isolating. Others have suggested it, 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 it's fairly standard. But th that means the infection will be running through young people, won't it? Once again, the youngest in our society, those that have lost, frankly, from certain perspectives, the most in all of this, will once again have to, have to suffer. Tell me that this isn't, you know, herd immunity by another name. So, uh, again, as I always say, there's a balance. When the, uh, this awful illness struck, uh, it was very apparent that uh, certain groups were much more vulnerable than others. In the case of COVID, it was uh, older people. That's why the vaccination rollout w happened the way it did. We, we targeted older, more vulnerable uh, people. And the, the view, the medical view, was that younger people had more protection uh, than more vulnerable groups. Uh, clearly, we are looking at uh, vaccinating younger people. We're looking at what JCVI are going to say. Um, but uh, we feel that on, on balance, uh, the best approach is to try and get our kids back into school and get them back uh, into normal life. Where do you personally sit on the idea of vaccinating, you know, 12 years and above? Well, I don't know what the medical uh, opinion is. I would definitely defer to the JCVI on that, and they're going to um, make their, their ruling or their, their judgment uh, public very soon. Do you not, though, have, have any concern? There's no one in government around the cabinet table expressing concern. You know, you think back to kind of, you know, late last year, cases were nowhere near 100,000 a day, but infection was running rampant in parts of the country, in Kent, for example, and a variant of concern emerged. I mean, if we're talking about running higher than at the highest point, you know, in the January peak in terms of cases, there is a real risk, isn't there? that we're just you know, playing a waiting game until another domestically produced, perhaps even more resistant to vaccine uh, uh, variant emerges. So again, there's, as I always say, there's a balance, but the critical difference between this time mm -hmm. and late last year has of course been the vaccine rollout. We've had 75 million doses. We've had two thirds of the population uh, certainly getting the first dose. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a completely different scenario than was the case last year. Uh, just to, to stick to stick with businesses, and of course, plenty of people have been challenging the government on the the, the removal of the mandatory requirement, requ the mandatory wearing of masks. W where do you sit on that? In what in what circumstances will you be wearing a mask? So I've always said that uh, I believe in individual responsibility. I think businesses uh, have a, 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 their own discretion, their own judgment. I think uh, individuals uh, should also use their own judgment. Um, personally, I would I use the tube a lot in London. Uh, and I would probably use a, wear a mask uh, in, in that context, in, in the tube, in public transport. That's a personal view. Uh, it's not something that I would mandate or necessarily dictate to other people. But you'd be quite happy for businesses, say airlines, hospitality sector, 
to require, to continue to require people wearing a mask inside their premises? Yes, I mean, it, actually before COVID, it was very interesting that businesses always had, um, have always had the ability to, to prescribe um, certain um, health or, yep, or they've, all, they've always had that. And I think we're going back to, the, to that situation. People have forgotten that actually businesses did have some discretion in terms of what people um, could, could, come, uh, could wear or, or... But the thing that people have always struggled with this is that the wearing of masks, yeah, there's a degree to which it's a prophylactic measure that you're looking yeah. after yourself, but it is, in essence, about looking after others. True. I mean, if you are someone who, say, has leukaemia, you're immunosuppressed, you're sitting on public transport, do you think that they have a right to demand that other people wear masks? When so, public transport. so if we wind the clock back to pre-COVID, we had people who were immunosuppressed, we had mm -hmm. flu, and what would happen in those days was that the, they would take the advice from their doctors, they'd mm -hmm. take medical advice. And I think I'd expect that to continue uh, post-COVID. Uh, one quick question just before you go, of course, the football on tonight. We, I, I will be not necessarily supporting with full voice, but I'll certainly sure. be cheating a little bit from the sidelines. How do you think it's going to go? I think England will win. Um, we haven't conceded a goal yet. I think it's a pretty remarkable. Well, you've got Scotland to I don't want to jinx. That. I don't want to jinx anything. <laughs> um, you know, government ministers predicting uh, uh, football uh, games probably isn't the best thing for us to do. But I, I think, I think on form, if you look at the, what's happened, I think England have got a really good chance, and I hope uh, hope they can uh, they can actually convert their brilliant performances into a victory tonight. We will soon find out, won't we? Uh, quite a quarter. Thank good you. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for Thank joining you. us.